Hello, 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 everyone. Good morning to all of my UMBC colleagues and partners, and good evening to all of our prospective student candidates. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our Professional Programs International Information Session. My name is Dustin Hodgson, and I'm the Director of the Office of Professional Programs within the Division of Professional Studies. And I'm thrilled, thrilled to be a part of your educational journey, and I hope that you'll enjoy today's session. So, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC, is a mid-sized public research institution. UMBC, UMBC ranks number six in the most innovative universities, according to the U.S. News and World Reports. And obviously, you see other, the national universities we rank there in U.S. News and World Reports, and best value for schools in U.S. News Report. And as of spring 2023, UMBC has over 3,000 graduate students and over 100 countries represented on campus. Um, there are 12 unique master's programs within the, U within the professional programs portfolio and 20 plus certificate program options. And today you'll have the opportunity to meet with the program directors from the following programs. So we have representation from the biotech area, um, cybersecurity, data science, professional engineering programs, um, entrepreneurship, innovation, and leadership, geographic information systems, health information technology, learning and performance technology, and last but certainly not least, software engineering. Another important item to, to clarify is our campus location. So UMBC is located on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. It's between Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, DC. So these, ro these robust locations provide great opportunities for our students. It's also important to, it's also important to, po to point out that the university has two campus locations. So the first location is, lo is located in Catonsville, Maryland, and the second location is located at the universities at Shady Grove, which is located in Rockville, Maryland. Finally, I want to highlight a few important items in relation to the Masters of Professional Studies, the MPS. So the MPS is, a unique, is uniquely focused on applied learning. Number two, the instructors are industry practitioners with experience in their specific field of study. And number three, and finally, the program concludes with a capstone project that directly relates to industry. So with that being said, I hope that you enjoyed to the remainder of today's program, and I would like to turn this session over to my colleague, Adam Julian, who is the Director of the International Students and Scholar Services area. Adam? Thanks, Dustin. So it's actually going to be me, Natalie, today, um, representing um, the Center for Global Engagement. Um, and um, so before we get started um, in all of this, my name is Natalie Lobb, and I am the Assistant Director of International Recruitment um, within um, the Center for Global Engagement at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, so we can jump in to um, a short presentation to let you all know a little bit more about UMBC um, and some of the uh, professional programs that we offer on our campus. Um, and help you discover more about um, student life here at UMBC. So um, we are going to get started today. Um, I am joined um, by one of our fantastic global ambassadors today, um, Nastron. She is here with us. Um, I hopefully she I know she's here, so I'll have her um, share her screen um, or take her video off um, right now. Uh, I'm having technical difficulty with my video. So. That's okay. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Awesome. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, my name is Natalie Lobb, and I am the Assistant Director of International Recruitment within UMBC's Center for Global Engagement. So, I work with all the other programs um, across the institution, and we work very closely um, with the Office of Professional Programs um, to support their um, international efforts um, and help welcome all of you who are on the call today to UMBC. Nastron, would you like to introduce yourself? 
course. Hey everyone, my name is Nastra and I graduated my undergrad from UMBC too with biology and biological science major and I started my master program last semester in health IT and here I am today. So um, a little bit more about Nastran. Um, she is, um, like she said, um, she is currently studying an NPS in health information technology. Um, and she also got her um, undergraduate degree at UMBC too. So um, it's a bit of a, I know um, in my previous conversations with her, um, it's a bit of a, a family um, affair um, here at UMBC. She's had siblings who have attended here as well. Um, yeah, so. my brother had graduated uh, during COVID and he got his PhD in mechanical engineering. And I think that was the kind of reason that I chose to come to UMBC, but I know someone there. I'm going there. <laughs> That's a that's a great reason, and I know that um, you've really um, adapted to life here in Maryland and in Baltimore. And um, on the screen, you can see some of um, Nostron's favorite things um, about um, campus life um, and living in the area as well. So um, I know that there are some of the things on that list that I haven't done before, and I was looking at it the other day, and I was like, oh, I want to try this restaurant. Um, so I'll be sure to do that um, very soon and on maybe on the next presentation, I'll let you know what I think of it. All right. Um, so um, just uh, one more reminder, we'll leave some time at the end of this um, short part of the presentation before we jump into the breakout rooms for any Q&A. Um, so if there are questions, I can't see the chat personally right now. Um, so that's why we're going to leave some time at the end so I can um, jump in and see some of the chat. Um, if there are any program specific questions um, throughout this presentation, um, those will be answered in the breakout rooms. So I hope that's helpful for all of you. All right, so um, Dustin covered it a little bit, but we're going to jump into um, a little bit more about UMBC. Um, so we are um, a mid-sized public research institution. Um, our main campus is located in Catonsville, Maryland. Um, we also have uh, another campus located in Shady Grove, and I'll show that on the map very shortly. We are um, one of only 146 universities in the United States to receive the very prestigious Carnegie One um, research classification. And what that means is um, we do a very high level of research activity. And while um, a number of the MPS programs are more applied learning and practical, that does mean that there are very um, highly regarded faculty um, that are coming to the university um, to teach you um, in, in your programs. And this also supports the growth of um, resources and staff at the institution as well. So this is a very big accomplishment for UMBC. Um, as you can see, we have over 3,300 graduate students here at UMBC. And like we said, over 100 countries represented. A little bit more about our location. We're just about 10 minutes outside of Baltimore um, proper. Um, and there's also a shuttle that can take you right into downtown um, for free. Um, we are located on the East Coast in one of the US's largest commercial and technology regions. So this is very um, special and important for um, after you graduate um, for finding um, jobs and other um, you know, employment or going on and doing further research. Um, we're also very close to BWI Airport, so if you choose to travel while you're here, um, there's that opportunity as well. Um, as you can see, um, we also have uh, the Shady Grove campus located in Rockville, Maryland. Um, there are a few programs um, on the call today that do offer um, courses at the Shady Grove campus, um, and it is very close to Washington, D.C., um, Nastron, I know that you live in um, in downtown Baltimore. Um, how long does it typically take you to get to campus? Let's say when there's not traffic. Yeah, then for, if I drive myself, it's about 12 minutes until 15 minutes. It's not that far. And also there, we have shuttles, like they have a station in the downtown. So if you walk there after that, still it's like 12 minutes in shuttle or something like that. It's not that far. No, it's not. It's not. So um, that's nice um, for all the, you know, the fun things that you might want to do off campus as well. Um, but we are located um, physically. Campus is located in a very safe suburban, um, quiet community. Um, but you're just very close to all the sites and all the things that are wonderful about Baltimore as well. And then only 40 minutes from D.C. So that's um, really great as well. Just some fast facts about the institution. 
Um, so there are over 2,400 international students at UMBC and just under 14,000 students total. Um, for students that are employed at graduation, 100% of those students are in jobs related to their career goals. So that's really awesome about our institution. And um, UMBC is about 25% lower um, than the average tuition costs of area universities. Um, so that's really wonderful. You're getting a um, great return on investment and value for money if you come to UMBC. And we'll jump into a little bit more about that later, but that's just something that we wanted to point out to you right away. Some uh, great campus highlights, and I know Nostron um, utilizes a lot of these um, very regularly, but we do have a state-of-the-art fitness center on campus that was recently renovated. Um, we also have a um, comprehensive health complex um, and then um, several grocery stores within walking distance of campus. So that's wonderful if you do um, you know, need to walk to the grocery store or don't have personal transportation. However, um, we do have free um, transport for students that take you to area grocery stores and shopping as well. Um, and then we also are well renowned for our um, student services on campus, um, including our career center um, that is award winning um, writing center and 24 seven um, study spaces as well. Um, Nastran, do you just want to jump in here quickly and talk about some of your favorite campus highlights? Sure. Well, uh, our gym, which we call it RAC, I have to use there, and it's one of my favorite places because they always they have fitness classes. You can join with your friends to play basketball, volleyball, tennis. Or it, I think it's really good place to be stressed for all of the that you have now. And other than that, about the health service, I really they build a new building and everything is all together right now. We call it well-being center and you can ask for any appointment for your vaccination or also you can uh, get counseling and which was really great for me after like moving. It's some kind of you. It's not easy moving from other country to new countries. Sometimes you need the help and they are always there for you. And yeah, that's it. Thanks, Nasran. Of course. All right, um, and I do have another question for you. Um, what kind of support, and you jumped into it a little bit um, with the Center for Wellbeing, but maybe you have a few things to add. Um, was there any other support that you received um, when you were planning your arrival or immediately after your arrival um, for your first weeks in the United States? Yeah, uh, before arrival, we had like orientation, like they went to go through everything that what is that we have to do, even like in airport, uh, in airport, and also after we arrived to school. And other than that, we have an orientation in school. Like it was really helpful. Even we talked about the culture of United States. Like it was really funny for me. Like I remember. Michelle, she told us like if someone asks you, "Hey, how are you doing?" You don't really need to like say whole sentences that how are you doing. It's just a saying in United States. They just like want to know how are you doing. It's just hi. So it was a really good orientation, and also they told us a lot about the school, how uh, technology wise, like what we have to do and what's the next step. And they connected us to the really good resources to ask other more further questions if we have about a specific program or any other stuff. Thanks, Nastran. Um, a little bit more about um, our rankings and reputation um, here at UMBC. As I mentioned, um, we're um, Carnegie Research One classification and we're one of only 146 institutions in the U.S. Um, we're in the top 9 and 10% um, of U.S. universities according to Times Higher Education and QS World um, University rankings. Um, and we are also the number 12 recipient of um, NASA funding in the U.S. So that's a really awesome thing for us. Um, and it is um, helpful for students as they go and look for employment after graduation. Just going to run through a brief overview of the graduate admissions process. Um, as Dustin mentioned, um, there are a list of professional programs. And I know that some of you may be on mobile today. Um, but we'll share these slides after the presentation so you can look at this a little bit more closely. Um, but 
this, the column on the right, you'll be able to see some of our um, programs that we have, um, whether or not they're considered MPS or MS. And I'm sorry, I made one tiny typo on there and forgot um, the degree type for learning and performance technology, um, which is an MPS. Um, and then you'll be able to see all of our STEM eligible programs, which I'll jump into briefly a little bit more. Um, and then as Dustin said, um, Masters of Professional Studies typically is more applied learning, which is really hands-on industry experts serve as faculty members and academic programs typically conclude with a capstone project. Masters of Science programs are more heavily based in um, research activities, but they are also do have facets of hands-on learning as well. And those programs typically conclude with um, either a capstone, a specialized presentation, or something like a thesis. So um, just wanted to let you all know that the graphic on the right is not inclusive of all of the professional programs at UMBC. Um, so the resources will be shared so you can see the full list um, and these slides will be shared after so you can dive into this a little bit more. Um, some of the admissions requirements for graduate programs, again, please look at the specific um, program requirements and you'll be able to talk about this a little bit more in the breakout rooms um, with the specific programs and learn more about what they require. Um, but, you know, there, typically there is a minimum 3.0 GPA, um, but there are some programs such as data science, which is on this call right now, um, that require a higher GPA overall. Um, GRE is dependent on the particular program. Um, you are required to submit letters of recommendation as well. There are multiple required, so be sure to check your individual um, program requirements to determine how many letters of recommendation are required. Um, you also will be required to submit a goal statement um, that goes through some of your academic objectives um, and your background um, pertaining to the program that you are hoping to enter and maybe some of your goals after graduation as well. Um, other requirements include a $50 application fee, um, submitting um, a resume or a CV, and then any other documents that are required by the specific program. So you'll be able to talk more about that in the um, breakout sessions. Nashran, um, can you share with us a little bit about how you have experienced innovation and hands-on learning while at, at UMBC? Yeah, sure. Uh, during my undergrad, I had a couple of chemistry lab, physics lab. Physics lab was, was one of my favorite because like we were sitting in a classroom sitting, but we had all the stuff to try out every like new role or everything that we are learning. So it was a really great opportunity to feel that what are, what are we learning. And also in our chemistry classes, we had all of the technology and you know, all of the material that we need to use uh, to, for a specific lab, uh, lab uh, project. That was really great. And other than that, during my undergrad, I was able to join a lab for research. And in that lab, I had my own project and my uh, professor was helping me go through it. So, but still I have access to all of the materials that I need. We discussed my program with other pro uh, professors to make sure like I'm gonna get the result if I work with this materials or in that way. So I think it's really, and I gained lots of hand-on experiments and I believe it helped me a lot through my career. <laughs> Thanks, Nastron. Um, and just to um, add a little bit more to that, um, I know recently I was speaking um, with one of our recent data science alumni and talking about some of his um, hands-on learning that he experienced while he was in his degree. Um, and he really jumped into some, um, you know, interesting projects that he did um, that were really real life um, kind of, um, you know, assignments that he had to do and they were, you know, they were practical um, you know, decisions that he had to make um, with his classmates in, in the classroom. So um, I, I think I share a quote later on from him um, in this presentation uh, so you can get to know a little bit more about why he chose UMBC and some of the practical learning experiences that he had while he was here. Some um, really important postgraduate admissions tips. Um, for all of you as you go and um, begin your application to UMBC. Um, something that you really want to do when, while you're considering the university is to demonstrate a really strong understanding of UMBC and why you want to attend here. Um, how do they relate to your personal goals, um, your education goals, and your professional goals as well? Um, it's very important to check all deadlines as well and ensure that all materials for the program 
um, that you are applying to are submitted by that deadline. Um, another recommendation um, is about your recommendations. Um, and that is that those letters um, should provide more than just general feedback um, and provide some detail on, um, you know, your quality of work, um, your experience with your recommender and anything else um, that really aligns with the program. And then um, last but not least, always, always, always check your email after you submit that application and make sure that there's nothing missing or you're not receiving any communications. Um, from UMBC um, directly for any follow-up um, action that you might have to take. This here are some of the English language requirements. If you really look at the column on the right-hand side, this is what we're talking about today. Um, you'll notice that most of these are arranged, so English language requirements are dependent on the individual program. Um, so be sure to check the individual program pages um, or speak with the program directly about the um, individual English language requirements for the program. Just going to um, jump into the student experience a little bit more at UMBC. Um, we have 270 uh, student organizations, so there's something for everyone here um, on campus. And if you can't find it, you can always start your own club um, as well. That's one of the wonderful things about the institution. Um, and as Nastron said, there are wonderful ways to keep yourself entertained when you're not in the classroom, such as the Retriever Integration Center, our homecoming um, festivities. The game room is a really popular location for all students to, to take a break and meet other people as well. There are ways to um, build community and leadership while you're here at UMBC, um, including um, there are new student events for um, incoming graduate students and international students. Um, there is a special admitted student um, Unibuddy chat group where all new students can speak with one another so that you can build that community before you even arrive on campus. Um, so you're not coming here alone to UMBC. So you already have people you know and people you can connect with. Um, and that's something that I know a lot of our new students at UMBC have found very helpful for their arrival. Um, there are also other leadership opportunities such as student government um, and within uh, the Center for Democracy and Civic Life, as well as the Shriver Center, which is our social justice center on campus. Now, Sean, do you want to talk a little bit more um, about what's special for you about the UMBC community? Well, the first thing that caught my eyes was like diversity, because as an immigrant person, it's really important that the school that you're moving in and you're gonna live in that school, you, you are not the only person. And I think that's really great about UMBC. There's like lots of students from many different schools and also, uh, sorry, many different countries. And also there is really great uh, support system. ISS is, is always there for us whatever we need, like even something which is not related to like our academic stuff, we can just email and ask, they are always there to help us. And I think that was the first thing that, that was really important for me. And other than that, the academic, the ranking of the UMBC, especially for biology when I moved here because of my biology undergrad, those are the things that this was really, that was really important for me for choosing UMBC. And Nostron is a really great representative of someone who supports our incoming international um, student community because she's one of our global ambassadors. So um, I know you said like, you know, it, it's com coming to a new country is really difficult and it's not always related to academics. It's, you know, you want to make sure that you have people around you um, that you, you feel comfortable with or you want to be able to make new friends. And um, Nostra is someone who's really great that um, a lot of our prospective and admitted students speak with um, to help feel more comfortable and, um, you know, get to know what student life is like. And, you know, she's really encouraging um, yeah. about helping students, you know, ease into that transition coming into the US. So you've done a really great job at that. Um, and so have all of our other um, global ambassadors as well. So um, if you have concerns about coming to the US, I know it's a big change, um, but all of our current international student ambassadors are here for you um, to help support that transition. There are additional ways um, that students learn beyond the classroom. And these are just some of the things um, that graduate students can take advantage of while they're at UMBC. Um, Promise is our hub for professional development for UMBC graduate students. Um, 
They'll help you um, with doing any research. Um, if you are in a more research based degree, um, presenting posters at conferences, um, and they host a number of very helpful sessions um, for students as well. There are academic clubs and meetups. Um, a lot of times some of these meetups bring in industry experts to teach you a new skill or um, talk about finding employment in the region and what that's like after graduation. Um, GEARS is one of our most popular events for graduate students on campus. And this is an opportunity for graduate students to showcase their learning, um, either research or practical based learning, um, participate in competitions, um, and support their peers. It's an awesome um, event for students, and I know I am always fascinated with some of the projects and research that our students are doing on campus. Just to jump in um, a little bit more, um, we can go over this um, in more detail in some of our other sessions, but some accommodation options to consider as you're looking at UMBC. So there's on-campus housing, there's off-campus housing, and there's two different types of, we'll say types, categories of off-campus housing. So that might be here in the local area of one of the Keatonsville suburbs, or also um, more into downtown Baltimore. So that's a, what a lot of students consider. So um, you'll find the, the right fit for you, but there are some things on the screen um, that can help you sort of make that decision. Um, most graduate students choose to live off-campus, either in the Keatonsville suburbs, um, or in downtown Baltimore. Um, Nashra, I know you chose to live um, more in the city of Baltimore. Um, some just highlights of Baltimore um, that we talk about is that you're in the center of it all. So um, home to some of the area's top attractions, such as the National Aquarium, Inner Harbor. Um, you're, you know, you're close to the train station, so you can quickly get down to Washington, D.C. if you choose to do that. Do you want to talk a little bit more about why you chose to go into Baltimore? Yeah, of course. Well, uh, I used to live in big city, and so that's one of the reasons that I know that I want to live in the city, and it's close to the water. I can go by walk the water every morning, and that was one of the things. It's really meditating for me, so I really wanted to have that in my life. And also, there's lots of, like, activities around here. You can go, like, for a run, everyone is running all the time, like you don't feel unsafe, like because all the time there's someone walking their dog or they're running. So <laughs> I really like that part of it. And other than that, I think it's close to everywhere. It's close to DC and at the same time, it's close to school. And I had a chance to live with wonderful roommates that I have. So I like it that part. Thanks, yeah, I like that city life too. So that's sort of you know why I chose that. That was an important factor for me. Um, so it's all up to you about what um, what you're really looking for in your accommodation. So um, just going to wrap up the presentation shortly with um, some employment options and a quick overview of what that is like. So um, on-campus employment is typically in the form of a graduate assistantship or an hourly campus job. Um, and I'll provide you with more detail on this in a moment. Um, Off-campus is um, known as curricular practical training or CPT and optional practical training, which is done after graduation, that's called OPT. Um, UMBC is very well regarded for our supportive um, U CPT and OPT policy. So we do encourage students um, to explore employment options um, that are aligned with the requirements, but we want you to be able to get that practical experience um, while you're here um, as you know, part of your, your journey as a student um, and then beyond. On-campus employment, students are eligible immediately for this. It must be on campus and paid by the university. Um, students are eligible to work up to 20 hours a week during the semester. Um, however, this shouldn't typically be relied on um, as a primary source of income, but students are eligible um, to work immediately upon arrival on campus in the United States. Regular practical training is um, something that students are eligible after two full-time semesters in the United States. It must be related to your degree program um, and it occurs before the completion of your degree program. Um, so it, students, same as before, you're eligible to work 20 hours per week during the semester um, and then 40 during semester breaks. But this allows students an opportunity to complete an internship and begin working in their field. After graduation, um, this is what's known as optional practical training. 
Um, it's typically a maximum of 12 months and it should be full time, but it allows you to continue um, that experience that you're trying to get in the field um, and take on more employment. Um, and again, it must be related to your degree program. If you are in a what's called a STEM eligible degree, um, you do have an opportunity to um, add on to that um, work experience for an additional 18 months. Um, so I'll make sure that that gets added onto this slide. Um, but it is for STEM eligible degrees, um, and it is something that also must be related to your degree program. Um, but it's another opportunity for you continue for you to continue to get that employment experience. So this is something that students have a lot of questions about um, as part of their journey um, to becoming a graduate student at UMBC, um, which is graduate assistantships. So this is an opportunity for students to work closely with faculty, staff, and other students um, while gaining further expertise um, in their study area and in the field. There are six types of GAs um, listed on the screen at UMBC, but I wanted to go over some very important information about graduate assistantships. Not all programs offer graduate assistantships, um, so keep that in mind. Um, however, for programs that do offer graduate assistantships, students, um, you know, when they're looking for them, they may only be eligible after completing one to two semesters. So we encourage students to review the requirements for any available graduate assistantships that are advertised. Um, at UMBC, there are also administrative graduate assistantships that become available. So these aren't necessarily within um, the academic departments, but this might be something in um, student affairs, for instance, or in other departments on campus. Um, also something to keep in mind, graduate assistantships are very competitive. So um, if you are taking the opportunity to apply for a graduate assistantship, if something becomes available, um, make sure that you are thorough with your application um, and you follow all the eligibility requirements because they are very competitive. Um, I mentioned earlier some opportunities to learn outside the classroom, and I talked about our Hub for Professional Development Promise. Um, they host some wonderful sessions um, for new students about finding um, graduate um, assistantship opportunities and really um, working on your application to make sure that you improve your application to become a graduate assistantship. Um, and do your best in terms of finding those opportunities. So um, if you are admitted to UMBC or you're a new student coming, um, starting at UMBC, be sure to take advantage of those opportunities. I'm just going to wrap up. I know I, I said I'll wrap up very soon um, about some of the career support and student outcomes. So um, UMBC is recognized for our award-winning international student career support. They have a number of services that they offer, such as resume review, interview prep, and professional development workshops. Um, they advertise um, jobs on campus, and then once you're eligible, jobs off campus via an online platform called Handshake. Um, they also do a wonderful international student career conference that's just for international students. You have an opportunity to talk with industry experts, um, go through some career preparation workshops, and learn about immigration options after graduation. Also, um, this is something actually that just happened last week is our um, UMBC Career Fair, where there are dozens of employers that come right directly to campus and um, help students explore uh, employment opportunities after graduation. So um, students have an opportunity to meet with them, discuss their options, and potentially find jobs and internships. Just some um, facts about our 2021 um, graduating class. Um, as I mentioned before, um, apologies if this is a little small if you're joining us on mobile, but like I said, we'll share the slides after the presentation. Um, but 100% of employed F1 um, graduates were in positions directly related to their career goals. That's something very important for a lot of our students. 93% um, of graduate alumni were employed or pursuing further education within six months of graduation. And 95% were engaged in applied learning, such as internships or research while they were completing their degree. And as you can see, um, top employers hire UMBC students and are looking for our students. So these are just some of the companies um, that hire UMBC international alumni. And you can see things like Amazon, Deloitte, Cisco, um, IBM, Oracle, the list goes on and on. But these are some of the top employers that are looking for our students. 
Um, so this is an interesting graph and options, um, ways that you can really explore what degree is best for you. Um, I know that you, some of you might be thinking about a very certain degree and you have a very specific career goal. Um, so it's really important to just to determine, you know, how you know, the degree that you're studying at UMBC and how it might align with your career goal. And there might be another program that you might want to consider as well. So this is just a very um, brief overview of what we call explore your options. So as you can see, um, Health IT, for instance, we worked very closely with the Career Center um, and our colleagues in the um, in COET to put this together, but you can see that you might, your you know career goals might align with something in consulting or human resources or as it explains IT um, or health informatics. So it's a really great way to explore um, and discover some ways of where your degree might take you um, after you graduate from UMBC. Um, and these are just some common career fields. It does not reflect all potential career paths. And it's important to note that there might be um, additional requirements for education or experience. Um, but this is a really useful handy guide as you're deciding which program that you want to apply for um, while you're considering your goals as well. Um, as I mentioned before, um, one of our graduates, Ujwal, he studied data science. He recently graduated in December. And he said he chose UMBC um, because it is one of the most innovative universities in the U.S. And he really had an opportunity to experience that hands-on learning through his coursework. And that's, for him, something that made UMBC very special. So lastly, we want to talk a little bit about the return on investment. Um, quality, opportunity, and value are three really important things when you're considering the return on investment, because it is a large investment um, in your future um, to come to the U.S. for higher education. Um, UMBC is renowned for our student support from both faculty and staff, and we do bring in top-tier faculty um, and leaders in innovation and research to really help support you on your journey. Um, this is a fact from 2019. I'm still waiting to get some updated numbers from our Career Center, but as you can see, the average graduating salary for our IT and engineering graduates is 80,000 to 84,000 USD. So that's a really great number. Um, now that it's several years later, um, that number is um, very likely very higher for that um, average graduating salary. And as I mentioned before, the cost to attend UMBC is 25% lower than other public institutions in the area. So you are really getting a value for money um, when you're comparing it with other institutional peers or similar caliber programs. So if you want to learn a little bit more about UMBC, um, you have the option to speak with some of our current students, just like Nasran. Um, and she'll tell you a little bit more um, about what student life is like. Um, she can help you an answer questions. Um, but also we have a number of other ambassadors, I believe nine more other ambassadors who are open to answering your questions about what life is like as a student here in the U.S. in general, what life is like at UMBC, um, what the classes and learning style is like. They're wonderful people to ask um, questions to because they're the experts on student life. Um, so if you want an opportunity to explore UMBC more, um, you'll be able to jump on the link on the screen here to, to learn more about all of our programs that we offer and then also um, chat with a global investor. So that is all from me today. So I will stop sharing my screen and I just wanted to run through questions if there's anything else. Uh, I have a question, like, uh, I'm staying uh, in the U.S. since 2012, uh, and I completed my master's in uh, India. I, I guess my uh, GPA is 2.8 something, and I would like to join to data science. So you said, like, uh, we uh, yeah, for, to go for the data science, uh, uh, the GPA should be higher. So what... Uh, how much uh, you are expecting uh, to join to the data science? May I know that? That is a very program specific question. Um, and that's something that I would recommend um, that is asked in one of the breakout rooms um, in your case for data science. Um, I will add that 
although there are GPA minimums um, and it does is dependent on the individual programs, UMBC does a holistic review um, of all applications. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, you'll be able to have the opportunity um, to ask this um, program specific question during the breakout rooms, um, which will come up next. Thank Any you. other yep. Any other Good. general questions about UMBC? Yes. Okay. Yes. I've got a question. Good afternoon from my end, perhaps good morning at your end. Um, I just want to be very, I, I just want to know what the decision timeline is if one should apply to day one. Then secondly, what role does experience, like work experience play um, in terms of your admission criteria with respect to um, being admitted into a specific program or not. And also, I want to presume that you partner with, or there are some um, student loan that some organizations partner with UMBC to give out to prospective students. Is it possible we have a, post, a names of some of these um, partnering um, um, financial institutions that could also aid um, students in their course to um, attend UMBC. I think um, that would be that for now. And also, I would like to know for January 2024, is it safe to start the application now? I'm asking because there are some countries like ours, like mine, who take several months to get visa done. So. I mean, I want to presume from my own end, this will be a good time to start application and perhaps get a decision as quickly as possible so that I can face the visa, um, the student visa thing. So I'd like you to just talk to that so that I'll get a better clarification. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll try to make sure that I get um, to all of your questions. The first question that you had um, was regarding the standard timeline and review. Um, so I'm just going to quickly share a slide on my screen. So as you can see here, um, this is a general timeline and review. So um, for depending on what program that you're applying for, and you'll be able to talk a little bit more about this in the breakout rooms, um, but you can see some of the turnaround time for individual programs. Um, if you're applying for something um, like an MS, the turnaround time is a little bit longer. So if you're applying in, say, February and March, that is a really heavy application season. So it does, the average turnaround time is about eight to 10 weeks, so a little bit longer. Um, if you're applying for one of the MPS degrees, it's a little bit shorter, um, but these are just averages and it does depend on the number of applications that come through. So I do hope that that's helpful for you. Um, and then your next question that you had, um, was about funding and loan opportunities. I'm not aware that we partner with anybody, um, but we do accept international um, loans. So that's something to keep in mind, but we don't have um, any um, partners specifically that we partner with um, in terms of assisting students with getting um, loans from financial institutions. Um, 2024 applications, Dustin, can you? So in terms of 2024, um, it is so that is an option now. So if you want to possibly look into that option, you do have that as a, as a possibility. However, um, I guess, so I forget who asked this question, but I think that in terms of um, to better understand the scope of your question, is it the, the rationale, is it because the, the timeline with the, the visa timeline is is um, extensive. Is that why you're thinking about delaying to the to the next year? So yeah, that, okay. So very well. Yeah, the intent to, for asking the question is because um, I'm from Nigeria. I reside in Nigeria, and it takes quite a lot of time, a pretty mm -hmm. long time, to get a visa date with the consulate here in Nigeria. And you wouldn't get a visa date if you don't have all your admission and everything sorted out. So it could take six months, it could take more. So it's pretty easy or it's better to apply pretty much earlier, know the decision from the institution, then you know that the next hurdle is how to get, you know, your visa and all. 
usually takes time. I can tell you for a fact that we've got just 10 months between now and January of 2024. So it's better to apply early and see if you can get things sorted out pretty quick. And uh, with respect to partnering with institutions, I, I didn't mean that you were partnering with any financial institution. I just wanted, I've seen a couple of um, financial institutions, so to say, who's got their, your name, uh, UMPC as though they can finance students in those institutions. So I want to be sure, I want to know if you're aware of this and if it's truly something that works. That's just what I want to say. Thank you. In terms of the, yeah, if, if your concern is um, systematically going through the visa process and giving yourself enough time, uh, you know best in terms of that process. So I think that if you want to give yourself ample time to get through that that process and you're, you're, you anticipate experiencing a lengthy delay or a lengthy time period of going through that, it might be best a better strategy to think about a next year kind of concept. So we do have um, spring 24 is the next intake. Um, so that can be a target area for you if that's if that's a little bit more feasible from a, a visa to pro visa processing standpoint. So that option is available. So if you want to go into the to the website um, to the graduate school website, yeah, those options are available now. Thank you, Dustin. So like Natalie said, let me jump in here. So individual questions about your specific situation in particular, we have um, obviously we have several partners on on the call today. Your individual questions would be best suited if you ask those questions during the breakout sessions, because it's some of these things may be program specific. So um, I would say if you have specific questions about the details or nits and nats about your specific program, I would ask you to you can address those during the, the appropriate time during your breakout session. So this is a, a good question, um, and I, only, I know we only have a minute or two before we really jump into the breakout sessions, but what are the job opportunities looking like on campus? Um, and, um, you know, that's including things like, you know, working at a retail operation on campus or working um, in a specific department. So um, part of coming to an institution in the United States is that you do have to show a minimum amount of funding for an entire year. And this is for any institution um, in the US. So um, this is what's called your I-20. Um, and you have to show proof of funding. So while there are job opportunities available for um, students on campus, um, we do tell students um, don't rely on this option you know, from day one um, to help support your entire funding while you're here. Um, you do have to show the ample proof of funding for an entire year. However, there are job opportunities that are, are available on campus, and those are typically at the beginning of the semester. Um, our event center hires a number of students. Um, our catering company on campus that helps run a lot of the food service operations um, hire a number of international students um, that have just arrived on campus. So there are job opportunities, um, but remember those are competitive um, and they are open to all other students on campus. So something to keep in mind, make sure that you have that minimum funding um, because that's required to even begin your visa application to come into the U.S., but there are job opportunities on campus as well. And I apologize earlier when I said LAPT was a Master of Science. Um, excuse me, that is a Master of Arts program. So thank you, Renee, for correcting me on that. This is one that I do want to answer. Day one CPT is not something that is allowed at U.S. institutions. So day one CPT is not something that will allow. You must complete two full-time semesters. Um, in the United States, so that's fall and spring before you become eligible for any off-campus work opportunity. However, you are able to work on campus that's um, paid for by UMBC on campus from your first day in the U.S. So it's on campus only. No off-campus opportunities um, can be taken um, prior to completing two full-time semesters in the U.S. 